hi everyone, thank you very much for watching or listening. Liam Hartry here, another episode of Presenting Champions podcast today, and I've got a very, very special guest today who I'm absolutely uh, honoured to have on the show. I uh, really mean that. Today, uh, rugby legend Ian Goff, um, who had an absolutely stellar career in rugby over 16 years, um, played in a lock forward position mainly, uh, two grand slams, six nations, 64 caps. Wales, uh, I think nearly 500 appearances, well known uh, as a pundit and has appeared on TV regularly, got a book out about his life as well, absolute legend of the game, but today it won't just be a rugby talk, we're going to be getting into some deeper aspects of Ian's life, uh, including the amazing work he's doing to help the youth um, around Wales as well, with different initiatives and uh, quite a few other aspects of his life. So uh, with all that being said, uh, as we finish talking about you in third person, Thank you very much for making the time for this, mate. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, no worries. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolute pleasure. So, getting into it from the beginning, um, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, obviously we will get into some rugby stuff, but I also think that people will be very interested to know about your life um, after the game, you know, post rugby. So, we actually met um, at a meet and greet, celebrity meet and greet event, uh, TMH Promotions, Tim and Leanne Hopkins. Big shout out to them. Um, do you do a lot of those those sorts of talks um, these days in uh, your, your post rugby life? I'd imagine you're always in demand, that sort of thing. Um, let's start there. I think that would be of great interest to people. You know, uh, what well, we would do. I was doing a fair bit before COVID struck, uh, and it was something I was never comfortable with. I, you know, I wasn't even comfortable standing up in a team meeting. You know, in front of my peers. You know, I would probably you know. With the peers, with my colleagues, it was probably such a harsh environment. If you said a word wrong, then you'd be jumped on, and the banter would be flying. So it was always a nervous thing getting up in front of people and and sort of talking. But it's something that I sort of told myself I had to get used to and had to get over it. And I, I'm a hot, I'm a hot runner, so I, I you know I, I sweat a fair bit. I used to sweat a lot in the game, uh, and I do in things like that under the lights. But um, Again, something I had, you know, I, I told myself I had to get used to and had to sort of uh, push myself to get better at and get more comfortable at. So it, it quietened down as soon as I was commentating on the Wales Scotland game. I did Wales England, uh, the infamous game where um, where uh, Alan Wynn had his uh, his handbag pinched <laughs> by Joe Marler uh, in front of eighty thousand people, and then the next week, the day before the Scottish game, then it got cancelled for COVID, and uh, and the world just you know, when went into sort of pause for two years and then everything dried up. So, you know, nothing was open, nothing was uh, nothing was handling. So uh, it, I, a few gigs before that one, that was, uh, you know, a, a few a few to get used to it. But again, it's just finding your feet again. It's like coming off, you know, uh, an off season with rugby and then trying to sort of go straight into the first game. And, you know, you, you like to have a couple of games under your belt to feel, to feel the pace. But uh you know, it was actually it was it was good fun that night because I was with uh, alongside Matthew Reese and Andy Powell, so we could bounce off each other a little bit. So uh, and and it was compared by the the great Lenny D as well, who's a who's a fantastic funny guy. So it was a uh, it, it sort of eased the nerves straight away. Although you didn't quite know what sort of Andy Powell was going to turn up, so it still was a little bit of tension. Very true, very very true. But it was a fantastic night and a really great event. Uh, as you say, the banter between you guys was just was absolutely fantastic and uh, really, really good. So, moving into uh, a couple of other aspects, I think would interest people about some of the work you're doing now. When we met on the night, you know, we spoke a little bit about the work you're doing with the youth and and um, helping people, giving back to people. Now, obviously, you also mentioned that that's been a bit affected by COVID as well. So there's sort of a, an upside and a downside, you know, by the sound of it, which is uh, which is interesting. But I really love that giving back because you know you've reached a Sort of dizzy heights, um, as, as they say, with your career. Um, we might get to that soon with the, with the piloting as well. But in terms of the work you do to give back and you know reach for the sky and, and some of this, uh, as it's as it's known, some of this work for people who are not as familiar with that, can you share a little bit about the work you do in that area and also what that means to you, please? That would be great to get into. Yeah, it was good. It was the issue was when when I was coming up to retirement, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do, uh, and it was a big anxiety issue for players. You know that they. You, know, you reach the top, you, you're playing in front of 70, 80,000 people plus and millions of TV, and then all of a sudden every career comes to an end. You know, it's it's gravity. So, you know, luckily enough, uh, I got to meet some uh, guys at the Ospreys, some of the sponsors, you know, they were sponsoring the Ospreys at the time. And it was an educational recruitment company. And they were very keen to give back. You know, they were, they were putting, you know, teachers into schools um, on the recruitment basis, supply teachers and different things like that. 
uh, and they were key to give back to the schools for the business. So uh, you know, the, the highlight that came, uh, what came back from the schools was their main problem. You know, I, I thought at that point it was sort of obesity and unhealthiness and, you know, that's where I thought it was going to go. But, you know, having you know, fed back from the headmasters from numerous schools, it was like an aspirational program. It was bridging the gap. Basically, so between the you know between the boys and the girls, the the boys used to outperform the girls by by a huge margin, and that's uh, that's changed over in the last sort of 10, 20 years. And uh, the girls are by far outperforming the boys. And again, there's you know there's a, there's a whole myriad of issues why that's the case. But uh, it was it was giving these boys a chance because the statistics of um, you know of of coming out of school without any qualifications, you know, without getting at least their you know five uh, GCSE, C, C and above, inclusive of maths and English. You know, the statistics were huge for unemployment and, and falling into the welfare system and uh, poverty and, and, and other assorted issues with with that as well. So we, you know, I started work with a, he was an ex-Deputy Director of Education, ex Inspector, Headmaster, but he, he was a very young Headmaster. I think he was one of the youngest Headmasters in Swansea at the time. I'd put a prolific career in education. Uh, and, and we put together, you know, he, he was an expert on the educational side and, and correlating it with the curriculum and, uh, and, and with my side, with the motivation, it was, it was pinpointed in, um, in research that, you know, these lads had looked up to role models, you know, the sporting sort of uh, sporting stars, if you want, I don't want to call myself a star, but sporting uh, you know, uh, uh, professionals. And uh, so we, we put together this program, Reach for the Skies. You know, Reach for the Skies came from sort of my love of aviation. Um, again, I was a, a brought up in a council estate in Cumbran in East Wales, a single parent family, me and my brother and sister, my older brother and sister. Uh, so quite humble beginnings and, and, you know, not much money in the household at all. Uh, and, you know, the sort of being, being able to travel the world as a professional rugby player and then outside of that, not just rugby being, you know, gaining my private pilot's license and flying, you know, all around Europe and, and places in the world as well was was the one issue that we said it's you know, we were going into schools not as a rugby programme, but it was uh, rugby was the vehicle, but it was the you know, you, you don't have to just be good at one thing, you can't put your eggs in one basket. You've got to sort of spread it across really and and keep studying it and keep learning more than studying actually so we go in to help these boys that are underachieving or you know attainment levels are down that they're pinpointed as a group that could achieve they've got the ability to achieve but for whatever reason uh, they're not quite making it and it's it's our job to sort of figure out how to turn the lights on you know how to how to sort of motivate these guys and and how to do it now i'd seen athletes you know after commonwealth and olympics and commonwealth on at the minute going in um, and doing one hits and turning up and doing one hits in these schools. And unfortunately, within three or four weeks, you know, the distant memory. So our, our issue was, right, we have to we have to go in at least three times. So we go into the school twice. So we, we go in sort of September, early October. Uh, and we do a, you know, we basically try to connect with the boys. Um, starts with a little bit of motivation. And then towards the end of that session, which is four hours long. So some of these guys that struggle with attention and, and other things it's a, it's a long time to keep them you know keep the, the attention so it, it it's a lot of uh, effort and sweat from us to, to try and keep it interesting and trying to keep it going and and towards the end of that session we start breaking into the skill sets that they're going to need to break down the issues that they have to to achieve in these exams and break it down where they where they're struggling uh and sort of pull through so the second time we go in is in january february after they've had their um their early entry exam results so just after they've had their sort of maths early entries if you want uh, early exams so it gives a border marker where they are you know with it with the final push to go so that's really skill based so sort of really sort of uh, real skill based stuff in two hours of quite intense sort of uh, you know short and sharp sort of 20 minute sort of um you know skill sets as such um you know mi and you're mixed up because it's got to be interesting for the boys otherwise you know they're just going to fall asleep and switch off and uh you know and not get anything from it so you know that's that's a, a two-hour intense session and then we finish it off around about the march just after the six nations finishes uh so enough we take them to the stadium and do the final session at the stadium so it, you know it, it just it's not just a rugby stadium you know with it with a welsh national stadium with the principality it, it hosts so many events and you know not just sports but music stars and you know, uh, and various other events as well. So 
the, the issue that we, you know, the thing that we try and put across is, you know, it's, we use rugby as a vehicle, but that's that's just it, a vehicle. We can make anything adaptable. It's, it's how you break things down, uh, work at it, you know, engage with your mentors, the professionals, the coaches, you know, the teachers to help you sort of break down these skill sets uh, and achieve on the long goal. So it gives me, it's, it's the, the, you know, the, one of the best jobs I've had, you know, especially outside rugby, where you know, I, I get a great sense of fulfillment for, for helping these boys, where I've come from a similar place to a lot of them. You know, I've had struggles academically like a lot of them as well so I, I can sort of I can I can, I can feel where they're, where they're coming from as such and we have fun you know we, we have fun doing it we, the boys have fun and you know we, we come away from some quite tough schools with some real challenges but uh, you know it's uh, the challenge is what I always enjoyed about sport and rugby and, and, and life so you know we, we do get a lot from it but uh, again it's been a two and a bit year break now with COVID and uh, we had a meeting, funny enough, uh, only about a week or two ago, uh, and we've got about five schools back on board to restart, to restart the program because, you know, when we were going in, these boys were struggling. They were demographic; they were struggling because of, you know, not lack of attention, but you know, lack of mentoring and, you know, the, the school pinpointed they need that extra help. Now that help has, you know, over the last two years when they've been homeschooling and such, is, you know, this group, this demographic of boys have, you know, it gets hit harder. You know, because uh, your know, engagement away from school at a computer screen is is not a lot of the thing. So, you know, the, the need is there. And I thought my colleague was uh, pitching to retire, to be honest, because he's, you know, he's, uh, he's he's a bit older than me. And, uh, he, you know, his, his heart is in education. And he said, no, they, these boys need us. You know, I, I want to carry on. I want to keep doing it. So, you know, we're just in the process now of, of, of sorting it out for the start end of September, early October, uh, and, and actually re-kick off as such. So, uh, yeah, in, interesting, because I've got sharp up on my uh, skills because it's been a few years since I've delivered it. So it's uh, a couple of little trial runs will be in the pipeline and, and get myself back match ready. Absolutely. It's, uh, it is absolutely incredible work that you're doing. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And I said this to you um, you know, when we met a few weeks ago. These people, um, you know, they, they slip through the cracks. It's, you know, they need people like you to really spend that time with them. It's just, it's wonderful, wonderful work. Um, there's so much you said there that's, that's fantastic. And the fact it's getting going again, wonderful. In terms of uh, also of work with, um, with the youth, I think people would be interested to know a bit about your coaching as well, um, because it, it's something that's been quite well documented, your coaching with the Ospreys. I think it's um, under 16s and under 18s that you've, you've been involved with, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and Let's talk a little bit about the work that, that you do with them as well in terms of the rewards you get from seeing them um, develop and, and improve um, and uh, things of that nature. It was something I'd heard a bit about, but researching for this, it came up in a few articles um, that you're involved in that. So please do share with us um, your thoughts on that side of things as well. That would be great to get into. Yeah, it's something I enjoyed. Uh, towards the end of my time at the Ospreys, we sort of, uh, you know, you realise your career is ending and, and, and coaching sort of, I, I sort of, I did enjoy yeah, especially the the younger guys, you know, especially the 16, 18 year olds, where you could you could see the learning curve, you, you could see they're improving. You know, they were I was lucky enough they were they were, they were pretty elite as it was, but they, you know you, you could just see them adapting, and learning, and taking on board what was what was being coached to them and uh, and putting it out on the on the field. So you, you could see that you know in the professional game it's quite tough because it's such fine margins uh, and games are settled on you know, such fine things, you know, such you know small mistakes, but in that age group was different you could just see a huge sort of progression uh, and it was great so i went up to my level three did level three sort of coaching certificates and uh yeah coaching for teams and teams and you know and quite a few of the boys that we were coaching actually came came through uh senior ospreys and and welsh internationals as well so that that's great to see on tv and think you know i was coaching coaching those guys but uh unfortunately when it came to an end with the ospreys uh, i had a season in london Ira. So couldn't pick up the coaching really there because it was short, you know, a nine month season where I sort of hopped in on, uh, you know, to cover for injuries. And then back at the Dragons, uh, again, I had a season finished, so finished where I started at Newport and at the Dragons. And uh, I, I didn't get a chance to sort of pick up any of the, um, any of the age grade teams there whilst travelling back and forth. So, uh, yeah, the, the coaching has, has sort of slipped by the wayside and the, and the commentary. You know the radio commentary and what was a TV commentary before COVID was, you know, starting to take in more of a, more prevalence. So um, yeah, it's something I'd like to get back into the coaching and you know my, my lads are 
I've got a 10 year old and a, and a two year old and the two year olds really sort of uh, take into all sports at the minute. And it's trying to prize my 10 year old into into putting the boots on and uh, and having a go and and helping out. And I'll I'll get back into the coaching. My local team is Narba now, who I actually played for at the end of my career. I had two games for them just to a bit of fitness before a, a veterans or a classics tournament. Um, so you know they they've invited me along as well with a hands full with their little with the babies at the minute. But uh, as soon as that pressure releases, then I'll probably look to get across there and, and get involved. Yeah, absolutely. That would be that would be incredible. Um, you know, passing on your knowledge in different ways. Um, so much respect for that. It's it's, it's an incredible thing. Um, another youth-based question before we get into a few other things with your book and a few other things you've been doing and what have you. Obviously, um, and I was going to ask this at the end, but because we, we've got into it now, it's, it's a good time now. In terms of giving advice to um, people who want to succeed in rugby, or you know, if you do want to pass on any. Um, life lessons as well that you feel could be relevant for people. Obviously, I know you, you're doing this work coaching and you're giving back, but when I put this interview out there, it, it'll have quite a big reach. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to get one or two little sort of nuggets of wisdom, of wisdom from you um, that might filter on down, um, even if it's into people who are a little bit further afield uh, watching this or listening to this, who want to do well in sports. I mean, I know um, you said just now you, you don't think of yourself as a star, which is which is um, you know it's pretty humble. I mean, I think I think you're a legend, but that's by the by. But in terms of the passing on some of any of your knowledge, even if it's just one or two things, somebody comes to you and says, "I want to do well in, in rugby." You know, they're at that young age. I know there's some great coaches out there, but you've been around, you've done it all, so you're in a prime position to, to sort of give that advice. What would you say um, if someone asked you that? If they asked you for advice on, on how to do well in the game and Things like that, basically. Do you know what? That, that's the first stage, and that, that that can be the hardest stage because as uh, as males, we don't like asking for help as such, do we? We don't like asking, uh, you know, things like that. How can I? You know, what can I do to achieve? Uh, that, that's what, how we work with the boys as well. Is trying to get them to sort of be proactive. So if you have someone coming up to you, you know, you know that you know this this kid wants to be coached. It wants to get better. He's asking you, you know, how do I get better? How do I succeed? Uh, and that's the starting point. That, that's that's the biggest bit of encouragement you can give them to start with. You know, be proactive. Go go and ask for the help. You know, because sometimes you can just sit in your little corner feeling sorry for yourself, which I've been after many a defeat. You know, I uh, sat in the corner, felt sorry for myself, and you know, it's gonna is this my is my career gonna end? Is this is this gonna be it? And you know, even some internationals when we've had uh, you know it's gone against us. Uh, and it's just getting yourself back up and, and asking those questions, right? How do I get better? You know, how how can I, you know, how can I you know, be more consistent? How can I do it? And, and it's it's seeking that those professionals, those specialist coaches, specialist people that, that can that can help you and don't just give you the advice, but but put into act, put it into action. Just and it's it's what you're doing. You know, it's uh, you know, it's all right saying you know how are you, but it's saying you know what what are you doing? You know what are you doing at the minute, right? How how can how can we improve that? And and being coachable, that, that's that's one of the biggest things, you know, having that openness to go, right, okay, I'll, you know, I'm willing to take this advice, I'm willing to have a go uh, and try and better myself. And, and that, you know, I was, I say, a young lad from a council estate in Cumbran. Uh, if you looked at my stats for, you know, how fast I was, how strong I was, how tall I was, I was probably one of the shortest second rows on the on the international scene, at just under 6'5". You know that you know everyone in my position was at least sort of six six. You know, and you're only talking an inch and a bit, inch and a half. I was just under six five, so that that made that difference. You know, and again, not being strong, not being fast, but I I sort of made hay on you know on on sort of quite niche. You know, the, the niche of my game was sort of work ethic and you know uh, hitting pretty hard and you know being you know strong, strong, you know, sort of getting lots of you know hitting lots of rucks and making lots of tackles and. And doing the donkey work as such, but that was my niche. And you know, I would I would beat certain players to you know kick off chases because they weren't running as hard. But I would run as hard as I could, knowing you know I, I'll get that tackle if I run as hard as I can. And, and I can put that head in before the guy gets a chance to, to evade me. So it's, it's just making the best of your abilities as well. Uh, the, the great example I use is, is Shane Williams as well. We use it with the kids. You know, he was told he was too small. He was told he didn't make it. It was a time for big wingers. You know, the the Jonah Lomos of the world, and uh, uh, and he said, no, I, I I don't. You know, I, I'm not accepting that. I'm, I'm just going to make a niche for myself, and and that's exactly what he did. Made himself as strong as he possibly could to ride the tackles from some of these juggernauts that were trying to hit him, 
uh, you know, he made himself super elusive uh, and powerful off the mark and, you know, and, and he just had that will to, you know, to win and, and be involved in the game. You know, he, he'd, he'd be in a scrum half position at times just to get his hands on the ball, you know, and he, you know, and he managed, he took some heavy hits and he managed to ride a lot of them and, and come through as one of the best players in the world. So, uh, you know, it, it was things like that, you know, when if someone, you know, someone tells you you can't, but it's your attitude that, you know, I can and right. Someone will tell me I can and they will help me. So, you know, again, being coachable and being open to it is uh, and, and having a go, just, just have a crack at it, you know, have a go and, and see how far you can get. And, uh, you know, if I didn't end up playing for Wales, playing for Ospreys and stuff like that, I'd have played for you know, as high levels as I could have, you know, I'd have whatever team was the highest level I could have achieved and sustained, I would have done that. But again, i a little bit, say I say a little bit lucky, but you know, I, I took chances when they were they were given to me, and and uh, yeah, and worked hard through adversity, which uh, you're going to get as a player. You know, you're going to get knocks in life. You know, like you tell the kids in school, they're not kids, these, these boys in school, that you know, you, not everything's going to go your way, uh, and it's assessing like why didn't that go my way, and how how can I make it go my way, and how can I improve? And you know, as long as someone's got the attitude to do that, then uh, you know, they just got to have the right. Coaches like people to sort of guide them. Yeah, it's it's powerful advice, you know, which which I knew it would be. But what's great about that is it can apply to rugby, it can apply to sports, but you can apply a lot of that to life as well, which is um, a, a big part of why I do these interviews in the first place is to sort of pass on that wisdom to um, to people who need it from from the greats, you know, from people who've got to those those heights. Um, talking about a few other aspects of your life that I think would interest people, obviously you've got a book um, out as well. And obviously, just giving this a little bit of a mention uh, for anyone that doesn't know as well, Tough Lot to Crack, great name um, and a great read, but it's out there. Now, a lot of people sort of take that for granted, well, you know, you're, you're a well-known individual, you've got a book out there, um, that's what happens. But putting it in sort of in your shoes, if you get what I mean, having your life out there in print um, and seeing that as, as something that's, that's out there, people are reading, people are enjoying. Um, what is that like? I mean, actually having your life out there um, as something that people can sort of read and enjoy and you know get some benefit from and everything like that. It'd be good to uh, to get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I still can't get my wife to read my book. By the way, she she's I know I think she's probably seen the cover and I don't think she's probably even read the uh, the initial few pages. But uh, uh, you know, it is great to have. You know, and when I was approached by uh, Peter Owen, who was the press officer at the Ospreys, and he he did he already done a few books on the on swans. Over the football, uh, which he was quite passionate about, and uh, and he phoned me out of the blue. I think I was at London Irish at the time, and he said, "Coffee, I, you know, I, I fancy doing this. I reckon it'd be some good stories. You know, it'd be a good read." Uh, and you know, I, I didn't ever think, you know, I didn't ever, you know, you see like Shane Williams is writing books and and people like that. I mean, crikey, who would want to read my book? But you know, what was great is I got to sit down with Pete, and you know, he gave me some right just to try and you know look back and try and remember from give me certain eras and certain areas and we just had a sat down over a over a beer and, and a bit of food and, and and a good crack and had a great chat and I was reminiscing about some good old times you know some some really sort of good face and tough phases in my life but you know some really good times and it was it was it was a lot of fun doing it just to just to think back and remember remember periods that you know that was way back that you, you'd forgotten and it just sort of resurfaced so yeah, it was, a, it was a lovely exercise for me to be able to do. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't out to, you know, to sell as many books as I could, I guess. I, I, I didn't have the, my ego, the ego wasn't there for that. But it was just nice to have something in print of a, of a memory of things that's happened over the years and, and say, good memories that you can actually sort of refresh yourself just by having a read about them. Yeah. Yeah, it is It is amazing. And it must have been amazing to look back and, and reminisce in that positive way. But... Yeah, to put your, your life out there, um, like I say, I mean, people just assume that, that that's what people do and they've achieved things and so they should, but getting your thoughts on what it was like um, is, is, is very cool. Obviously, the concept of reminiscing leads me to um, to another thing is when you look back on your career, and I know this is, this is going to be quite a big question now, possibly, but in terms of your proudest moments um, out of your achievements, I mean, we have to give it a mention. Um, even though I was saying about your life post rugby and seeing what you're doing now and, and the, the fantastic work you're doing, when you do look back on on your career, all the games you played, you know the the many achievements I mentioned at the beginning, the Grand Slam, Six Nations, 64 caps, so on and so on. Um, what which memories are you most fond of now, 
whether it's um, you know a particular game, whether it's, it's certain people on the team, whether it's it could be any aspect of this because I know it's it's a big question. And I, I deliberately don't ask it in a, in a really narrow way because obviously you were the one who was uh, who was there um, doing it, not me. So so looking at it from your point of view, um, which moments stand out for you as being your personal proudest moments and why? Yeah, do you know what? It was, you know, I had a pretty long career, and uh, you know, you look so there's so many highs and lows in that career as well. Like my my first cap was a huge high and a huge low uh, at the same time. That was probably the the biggest high and low in the same game that you can have. You know, I you know I, I played it was 1998 out in South Africa, and it's still Wales's worst loss. You know, it was 96 points to 13 out in Loftus. So that's was nice to see the boys do so well in South Africa because. You know they were up against it, and they were you know the odds were against them, and the, you know everybody didn't give them a chance, and they and they really sort of you know they really hang in, and, and they were in the, a shot of winning the series, which is incredible. You know the first win out in South Africa, in South African soil. So I I'd been at the other end of that, but it was my first cap. I was super proud to you know I was only like 21, I think I was 2021, 20, and um, me and Stephen Jones and uh, our first caps that day. Uh, and it was incredible, you know. It was it was great. I got to represent Wales for the first time, but then the final whistle went, and I thought I'd never ever play for Wales again. You know, I thought you know it was a we're almost a national disgrace. I think as uh, JJ was uh, commentating for the said, you know, and uh, yeah, so a uh, high and a low, but you know, a cup final win with Newport. You know, my first proper silverway at the, at the Millennium Stadium against Neath, and dislocated my shoulder in that game. And managed to have it put back in just before the you know just as the final whistle went. So I got to celebrate with the boys and. Uh, and I get the first silverware, which is which is incredible. You know, Newport being my home club, so that was great. But the, you know, the pinnacle that always I always come back to. You know, when I thought my career was over, we lost to Fiji in the World Cup. I came on as a sub. Uh, I got dropped after that game. Coaches got sacked. Uh, this the game against South Africa. I was completely out of the squad for, and then had you know I joined the Ospreys. Had some form with the Ospreys, and Warren Gatlin came in, uh, and we went across to England and. We beat England for the first time in either 17 or 20 years in Twickenham, uh, and nobody gave us a, a hope. Uh, you know, I didn't think I'd get another cap, uh, and that tournament was fantastic. From losing to Fiji and coaches being sacked, you know, Warren Gatlin and the gang came in with three weeks prep, uh, and, and we beat a very good English side away at you know away in Twickenham, and then went on to win the championship, winning the Grand Slam, and my 50th cap happened to coincide with the Grand Slam. The finale against France at the uh, at the Millennium, uh, and I got to lead out. You know, the amazing you know Ray Gravel that sadly passed away the year before. I got to lead his daughters out, his young daughters, and I think they were something like you know eleven and fourteen or twelve and fourteen at the time. Uh, and got to lead his daughters out a year after he passed away, and he was a national hero, Ray. And, you know, I've spoken to his daughters about it recently. You know, they're in their twenties now, and I've uh, I'm still still saying that's my proudest moment. You know, walking. You know, I was very nervous, but walking, you know, you girls out, and then you know, we won the Grand Slam. I thought my career was dead and buried, and then here I am, played every game, and got my fiftieth cap and a Grand Slam winners medal. So, you know, I can't really, I couldn't really top that. I had, uh, I got uh, shortlisted for the Lions twice under two different coaches, uh, and didn't manage to get on the trip, but. You know, I I can't, you know, I'm not going to take it any way. You know, I had some huge highs in my career. That would have been a pinnacle. But, you know, that that game in 2008 against, you know, that tournament that ended up with that 50th cap on that game was, you know, I, I couldn't probably top that. Yeah, it's a, it's some amazing achievements there. I mean, there's so many um, in your career. But I love asking that question of, you know, great athletes, great sport people, because it's not always the answer that, you know, that you expect that, that comes back. So it's... Uh, Brilliant insight and brilliant, um, brilliant aspect there. Another thing in terms of sort of life post rugby, and, and this one might seem a little bit obvious, but I still think it's interesting for, for people to know about, is in terms of um, your friendships with you know people that you played with and um, you know guys that you keep in touch with. Obviously, when we, when we met the three of you on stage, banter was fantastic. But in terms of um, keeping in touch with teammates and what have you, the camaraderie of rugby is, is something special that you, you know you don't get in, in a lot of other sports really, I don't think with the same um, sort of how deep it, it, it can run, if you, well you know that better than I do. But in terms of the people you keep in touch with now and you're still friendly with now, um, I think it would be interesting for people to, uh, to hear a bit about that as well, even though it, it might seem an obvious question, um, it's, it's one of the beautiful aspects of the game. So um, yeah, in your own words, a little bit about some of the people that you still um, still know and still talk to regularly now? 
Yeah, what you can say, WhatsApp's an amazing thing. You know, these are uh, sort of networking sites. So uh, there's, there's a couple of groups we, we just had actually put together. Um, uh, the Dragons have been putting together little reunions. And then we, we start, we meet up for a Chinese in Abakan thing. There's a, there's a Chinese in the New Garden, which is a real deceptive, looks like a little terrace house that goes back about half a mile. Uh, and we've had a couple of little meetups. And we're only talking eight, probably eight to 10 of us, uh, you know, every, you know, maybe twice a year, something like that. But it was, you know, it sort of sparked me. It was great because, you know, some of the old stories, some of the boys that you haven't played with for like 15, 20 years and, we'll, you know, for about two or three hours, we'll have a laugh over a bit of food. And uh, and it was great. And and off the back of that, I thought, well, do you know what, we haven't done anything at the Ospreys. And I I go to the uh, libertyswansea.com, wherever it is now, uh, commentating, but uh, I sort of half pop in and, and but you have to go home. So, you know, some of the, you know, we had a, an absolute class team, you know, we had a, such a, you know, a great team at the Ospreys when I was there, but we, we hardly ever met up. So, you know, the idea of just meeting up with some of my old Dragons colleagues was, well, why haven't we done it with the Ospreys yet? And we, and we put our first sort of little reunion on um, one of the last games against the Dragons, funny enough, one of the last couple of games of the season. And, you know, it was brilliant. And we had 10 or 12 of us turn up and, uh, you know, we actually did at the stadium, watched the, the game and had a few drinks and, and just remember that, you know, some of the characters that were, you know, the, that I could remember back in the day were still characters now, you know, talking, you know, 15 years, 15 years on. But it was, uh, yeah, it was lovely. But I live, I'm living in Pembrokeshire now, so I, I've sort of moved away. I was living in Swansea, I'm from East Wales. I lived in Swansea for about 12, 13 years after I joined the Ospreys. Uh, married a local girl down here, I guess. And uh, we moved across here, just had our second. So I've been at the loop. COVID has sort of kept everything quiet. I used to, you know, I, I did a few of the Ironman uh, triathlons here, Long Costa, in Tenby. And, and at one point it was a rugby club because, you know, like sort of Shane Williams and Ryan Jones and Andy Moores and Craig, you know, the, the list goes on and on. It was, it was a, we could have put a Paul Arnold, we could have put a rugby team together. So it, it was great because we would train alongside each other and we'd do all this. And, uh, and you know, and, and still the Ironman's coming now next month. And we'll see them all again. But as in, you know, COVID have sort of put a bit of a spoke in the wheels and it sort of disrupted any meetups that we get. But the, you know, the, like, the little WhatsApp groups sort of keep keep things alive every now and then and keep the banter flowing. And and it's just, I think there's one coming up actually, Reese Thomas, uh, the the prop that, uh, that have played with Wales and, and the Dragons. Uh, he's doing a fundraiser. He needs, he needs a new heart, believe it or not. He needs a heart replacement. And uh, he's got a game of touch. I think it's the end of 27th of August. I go in my mind, and they've organised a big touch, like a touch tournament, to raise some money to try and get his, uh, get him a new ticker. So uh, that'll be that'll be the next one. So that's just started coming through on the on the group now, and you know, see how many people we can get across and and raise some good money for a for a colleague that's uh, in a bit of trouble at the minute. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, that's sad to hear. Actually, it's, you know, it's surprising what. Health problems people do get, but um, but then I know you know you do some some wonderful um, charity work actually. I mean I've seen um, things to do with dementia, to do with cardiac um, situations for people, and I've seen that you know you do a lot of that. So I'm sure people will rally together um, around him. And obviously, for anyone watching this, you you've heard about that. So if there's anything people can do, maybe they can contact you or you know whatever's uh, whatever's best um, for that for that situation. Moving into uh, a couple of other things, you said about Iron Man, you said about you're um, obviously you have to be quite fit and in very good shape to that. I mean, you obviously still train then. I'm, I'm guessing you obviously still keep very, very active. Would you say? Because I mean, Ironman's it's it's a tough uh, it's a tough competition, um, and it's elite. Yeah, you know, it was good because when I finished, it was like, what do I do now? And, that, and that's the thing a lot of players get. They they finish. They're in this fast moving environment, you know, a you know, very intense environment. And all of a sudden you retire uh, and it's like, you know, that fast moving environment is still going on like a, like a steam train. And you're just sat there on the you know, periphery, like, well, what do I do now? You know, all your mates are still in the changing rooms and you're out in the big bad world. So the Ironman gave me, you know, a bit of the triathlon stuff, give me a bit of focus. And it was because Shane was actually doing it. So, and he was struggling with his swimming at the time. So, uh, so the call came up. You know, come on, let's go and help Shane with the swimming. Let's do a few sea swims with him and give him confidence. And after a few sea swims, I thought, well, yeah, you know, that's that's the one thing I thought I'd struggle with, and it, it felt okay. You know, I, it felt good swimming in a wetsuit in the salt water. So you know, it's a bit more buoyant than being in a swimming pool. So 
that sort of, and then one drunken night, we had a bit of a party. There was a bit of a party going on, and the challenge was set forward. Why didn't you sign up for the Ironman? And uh, and that's what ended up happening. Waking up with a bit of a hangover, thinking, "Oh no, I did I actually sign up for that?" But it just gave a good point of focus. You know, it just gave something to go for, uh, something to attack. And it was, you know, it, it, it sort of was a substitute for rugby. At that point, it was a complete. You know, you're out of your comfort zone. You had to train differently. It was all you had to relearn things. Uh, and it was great. It was great. But, uh, you know, I, after my, I tried to do three in a year. And I, I failed out in France. I had a DNF in France. I, I had to pull out. I uh, was a bit, bit sick on the bike after the swim. And then when I did Wales two weeks later, and, you know, it was a, it's a tough, long day. And uh, I've decided I'm, I'm going to support it with all my heart now rather than do do the long course <laughs> events. But, uh, you know, it, I enjoyed. I did enjoy it thoroughly, and I, I've, you know, I've done many challenges since. We, we did Kilimanjaro a couple of years ago, and I've done the like the open stage of the Tour de France. Me and a few friends uh, drive out to France, and, and we've done that a few occasions as well. And again, COVID has sort of put a bit of blocks on me, and we're having you know the two young ones now. It's a little bit of motivation gone on it, so it's it's finding that next challenge to actually uh, you know to go. I think we're going to try and put on another Kilimanjaro trip next year. So that'll be good because it's a, it's a good, enjoyable trip. You know, it's, it's tough when it needs to be tough, but, you know, it, it's good good fun. We get a good good banter around it as well. So, you know, I look forward to getting that on. But, yeah, I think if um, if I put a little bit more weight on, which is starting to creep up, then I'll, I'll have to figure out a challenge that I need to... Actually, uh, Alex Popham is doing one for Head for Change. So uh, Alex has been uh, diagnosed with uh, early onset dementia and he's put a charity together, Head for Change, and he's... Uh, and he, he, you know, he, he's tried to make the game safer, uh, as well as other things. And I think he's putting on a charity swim across the channel through doing a channel swim uh, as a relay. So with uh, combining it with some of the rugby league boys, so that that could be happening. So if that comes about, if we if we get the green light for that, then it means I'm living in Amroth, so I'm not far from the sea. So it means me getting at the tail end of the winter, getting my uh, you know getting in the sea and getting a bit cold in the chop and. I get some training in. So, you know, that's, I've always, the thing with rugby, you, you've always got that motivating, you've always got something to chase, you know, you've got to, you know, start the season, you know, first couple of pre-season games, you want to make the European squad and then, you know, you want to make the Welsh squad and, you know, you've always got something to chase. Now, when, when you finish, it's trying to replace that with, right, what do I aim for? Because just training for training's sake, I struggle with. But if it's something that uh, they it puts a bit of fear in me that I think, right, if I don't train for this, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be a real tough day. It's gonna be a tough afternoon. And then that gives me the more of a motivation to do it. So it's it's putting a scary challenge and you know, it was Iron Man, you know, filled all the boxes with that. It was a scary challenge to think, right, I wanna finish this. Uh, and I've got to train right and I've got to I've got to attack it right to, to get over the line. So, you know, that's uh, what the next thing is. I'm not sure, but there's, uh, you know, there's there's always these crazy events that come up, which, uh, especially down here in Pembrokeshire, they're, uh, they're pretty good at putting these crazy events on. Yeah, yeah, be sure. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of activity there and it's a beautiful part of the world. So, so it's, it's not surprising in a way, but absolutely. Talking about that, talking about the health um, side of the game, obviously with, with Ryan and with different people, um, obviously recently we've had the, the book come out with um, Steve Thompson, I know that's England, but about his dementia and, and all you know, these different things. Um, in terms of the changes that you've seen in the game over over the years, be it positive or negative, I wanted to ask you about this because, uh, and obviously the health side, it sort of leads into that a little bit, um, although this, this could be in any area. When we met at the, the TMH show and you guys were on stage, you know, you were really getting into your stride about the changes in rugby, positive and negative, but also some of the changes that the game needs to make as well. You know, um, there were there were some things that you guys were feeling uh, particularly powerful. He got into his he got into his stride with some of it, didn't he? But but you all did a bit. In terms of the many years that you've been around, I know this this is a big question, but it's it's something people will um, definitely want to hear about. In your own view, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen um, for, the, for the positive, for the negative, either side? I'm sure people ask me about this a lot, to be honest, but it's still something that, is, uh, that I think people would be really interested to know about. So, yeah, in your own words, changes in the game. Let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, well, you know, as the game has become more professional and it's really bedded into professionalism, now, when it, I think it was 95 it went professional, 96. Uh, you know, we're way down the track now and, you know, I just... You know, I, I felt in the last four, sort of four or five years of my career, I felt that, that you know, not game was overtaking me, but just the intensity that the game was playing, and you know, the the athleticism that's come up, it, 
it used to be you know you know front five was uh would hold it together you know the old school front five boys but then it, it, to me it turned into a bit of a front row and a back five you know like you know the whole back five of that scrum were like back rowers you know the athleticism just sort of took off and it just got a you know the intensity of the game the ball and play time was higher you know the hits were becoming more intense everyone was stronger faster fitter and uh, hitting each other you know uh, at higher speeds i remember the uh god bless him jerry collins uh saying you know and two trucks are colliding that, you know, the, the, the trucks are going to break at some point, you know, as tough as a man as he was. And, uh, and that was his analogy there. So, he, you know, the tail end of his career, he, he sort of held off on, you know, because physicality was his thing, but he was a great player as well. And he, he sort of tuned his game to being slightly less physical in there, you know, rather than really flying to the hits, he was sort of, you know, adjusting how he tackled because the longevity wouldn't have been there for him, you know, because he, he just knew he'd have retired with, shot shoulders and, and everything everything would have gone so you know that intensity is you know and you know the spectators you know that's how games evolve i guess they get more intense but it's just making sure people are safe and that, that, that's the important thing because it, it's, it's and it's the children that you've got to think of coming through you know because they you know sports only a short career and you're a long life to live after it so, and, you know, we, I accept that, you know, my knees and my hips, uh, shoulders and my back is probably going to be a bit sore going into my 50s and 60s. But um, the, the issue at the moment is, uh, is brain injury. Uh, and that's that's something that you never, ex- you know, when you when you sign up to play rugby, you don't expect. Um, you know, the, the likes of, a, you know, a, a, an early onset dementia, the CT thing, the motor neurons, or, you know, if it's, you know, again, it, there's lots of research and there's lots of, uh, Delvin that needs to be done, but you know the safer they can make it, especially because you know, I've got I've got young children now. Uh, as a parent, you you want your kids to be safe. You don't want to put them in an arena where, you know, you're going to be looking after them in twenty years time, thirty years time, because of something they've done, you know, for sport, you know, for for fun. So you know, as long as they can make it as safe as you know they possibly can, then uh, you know that, that's a big change. I think that's another big change. It's, it's only little adjustments that you have to make and. And it's just being, you know, a lot of it is is common sense and being sensible. You know, but when there's a lot at stake, you know, so you know, there's a little bit of conflict of interest that kicks in, and and player welfare can can you know can slide down the list uh, because it's a win at all costs, and you know, go, it's 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 not a win at all costs. Basically, you know, you, you have got a long life to live, and uh, and that's something that's got to be put in the balance. Uh, and you know, we we want the sport to flourish, and we you know, it gave me so many things. Uh, friends, your know, places I've seen, and, and you know life. But uh, but again, you, you don't you don't want to be 40, 50 years old and and not being able to recognise your own kids. So again, it's it's being a bit pragmatic and, and making sure the research is there and the game is made as safe as possible. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it, it is wonderful that there's so much awareness um, coming out for that now, and it's really people are really opening their minds to it in the public as well, and it's, it's taking some pushing, but it's. Uh, it's getting there, so yeah, absolutely. So moving into the the last couple of things, um, you know, the, to talk about, because obviously it's getting late in the evening, and I don't want to take loads of, of time for the evening. But getting into the last couple of things, um, your piloting. I know it's not a rugby related question, but it's it's a it's a fascinating thing because you mentioned earlier about traveling all around Europe, and um, to be honest, I mean, it just sounds really cool. I mean, it's no there's no other way to put it. I mean, it's a very cool um, skill to have. And um, it'd just be great to get some stories about, you know, how you got into that, some of what you do with, with your travels. Uh, I don't know if you teach people or if, if it's just something you do yourself, to be honest. But just a little bit about about um, your piloting. It's clearly a big passion of yours. Uh, I've seen posts on your social media as well about the helicopters and different things. It just looks so cool. So please do share with us a little bit about, um, well, about that, about your piloting journey, basically. Uh, yeah, it's something I wanted to do as a kid. It was one of those things that, again, I, I, I had pretty humble beginnings. And you look up and you see, you know, you see the planes in the sky. And I, I, I was lucky enough to be, uh, we went on holiday. I think I might have been six or seven. And you're, you're allowed, you know, we asked the stewardesses and the pilot let you come up into the cockpit as they were flying, you know. And as a young kid, it's like, wow, you know, I could just see it's amazing, you know. And, you know, I was looking up and I remember going on a school trip and uh, Babak of anyway and, and the, the sort of fighter jets were sort of dropping down in the valley and doing low level routes through the valleys uh, and so we were at sort of eye level with them if you want as they were flying we were on the side of the mountain and they were sort of flying down through the valleys at sort of uh you know four or five hundred knots 
So yeah, it was it was just something that wow, I'd love to be able to do that. Something I'd never thought I'd be able, you know, to have a go at, you know, as a you know, just have the means to be able to learn. Uh, and, and I guess it's something that's why we sort of bring it in with the kids. It's it's right, how do I go about it? Like, what do I do? How do I go about it? I tried to I booked to go out to America to learn and then realized I had the wrong visa. It was after 9-11 and they, they made it super tight with the visas. So uh, I had to sort of say cancel the trip. I went out to golf clubs with me, I think, in the end and played a bit of golf and just traveled around Florida. Uh, but it, it sort of scuppered me. So uh, so I put a better plan in place then. <laughs> the kids and about two years later, we had a Welsh tour that finished off in Canada. I played out in Canada for a season. Uh, I had friends out there. So instead of going home with the boys, I, I stayed out, stayed with friends in, uh, out in Toronto uh, and learned to fly, you know, did my initial sort of two, three weeks up to solo, uh, flying out of Buttonville Airport, I think it was, north, just north of Toronto. Uh, and, that, and that started that journey. So I think that was 2005. And then I eventually got my license, fully got my license in 2007 at a Cardiff. And, uh, you know, it was, it was fantastic. And I sort of signed for the Ospreys then in 07 sort of moved to Swansea and just rocked up at Swansea Airport to one of the flying schools and said, right, how do I, you know, just got my license, how do I fly? How do I do more flying? Uh, and then got in, uh, got invited into, it wasn't a share actually, you sort of put so much money in to become a, a member of this group and it gave you access to one of the club planes and ended up taking one of those club planes around Europe, sort of a girlfriend at the time. Uh, season finished and, and we, we flew around and flew into Italy, into uh, Milan, uh, Palmer, sorry, uh, which the the Sidoli brothers, the second rows that I played with the Dragons and with Wales with Rob, uh, they were going out to their family family sort of house uh, in Bardi up in the mountains, just uh, not far from Palmer, a couple of uh, an hour or so from Milan. Uh, so we flew in, flew into Palmer, had a lovely couple of days with them, and, and flew back around Europe. And you know, we we came back, we came back home, uh, and I thought, right, what do I, you know, I. I you know, I've only just got my license and I've just flown around Europe and gone to these amazing places, stopped in Paris and uh, Cannes. Uh, and then someone gave me a backseat ride in, in one of these uh, yak planes that were a warbird that was based out of Swansea. Sat me in the back, pulled my eyeballs out for about 40 minutes, you know, upside down, inside out, and all others, and came down and said, right, how do I learn to fly one of those? Uh, and that was the next chapter. So I found someone that could instruct me, managed to buy a share, uh, and then that started sort of the aerobatic sort of side of things and aerobatic flying and you know, warbirds and, and things like that. And the latest one is helicopters, uh, which was my initial thought because they were so expensive initially. I thought, well, I'll learn the fixed wing side first and see if I enjoy flying rather than, you know, waste, potentially waste money if, uh, if I didn't continue it. And, uh, you know, you know I, I've just got my license uh, on helicopters now but uh, again they are expensive so <laughs> whether i'll be able to fly them anymore and get lots of hours i'm not sure but uh, you know we'll, we'll see we'll see how work goes to if i can facilitate that but yeah it's, it's been a passion i've managed to you know i've flown the games with the ospreys i flew out to dublin um, myself for one of the, you know, one of the games with one of my friends in the back uh, and got out there when we won the won the championship won the league out there uh, and there's some pretty cool places and i've been invited to some air shows uh, and the likes of Fairford, Riyadh, and you know some of these sort of other naval bases, and you know flown into sort of naval uh, and military bases in the plane, and done a bit of formation and, and formation aerobatics as well. So, you know, it's something again. I'd like to you know get more skilled at with COVID again. It's sort of put things backwards, but it would uh, it'd be something to get the taste for again and uh, get back into the aerobatics because that's. That is a you know it can be quite scary when uh, you know if things don't quite go right and you don't know why it's not quite gone quite so right then uh, it's a uh, it's a debrief to have to have to um, uh, and uh, and a thing to get right because if you, you know you only have to get it wrong one so, and it could sort of it could it could hurt you so but you know it, it's great fun and uh, you know the, the plane I'm flying at the minute is uh, is a good old old classic and you know lots of character about it and very noisy and it's uh yeah it's, it's something i'm very lucky very privileged to be able to do absolutely i mean it's uh, it's just an amazing skill set and that was the reason for asking and the freedom you know you must have up there um in the sky it's just uh it's just extraordinary so um obviously with the time last two things and then we'll uh we'll wrap this up because i i don't i don't want it to be 
too long past an hour anyway for people's attention spans to, to sort of watch it and everything. Um, so the last two things, obviously we've talked a bit about your future plans uh, quite a bit actually, so sometimes I um, I do close out with future plans, but you know we've talked about the, the initiative with the schools and the flying and the swim if it comes up and then it, you know you're certainly aiming for some challenges. So with the last thing, instead of that, looking back um, on your career now, playing and, and everything you've achieved, um, I asked you earlier about proudest moments, but sort of following on from that in terms of how do you feel that you are or you will be um, sort of remembered as a player, how do you want to be remembered as a player, um, how are you remembered as a player by, by fans and by people that sort of um, see you at meet and greets and, and all that sort of thing. And to get your thoughts on sort of legacy and um, some of your, your impact on the game and um, your impact on people who watch. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, 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 looking back, I know there's, there's a lot more to come in your future, but as, as soon as we've talked about that a bit, um, looking back on, on the game itself. The concept of legacy and your legacy in, in the game of rugby, um, what do you feel about about that? What are your thoughts on, on that side? I know it's a little bit of a deeper one. But what are your um, your thoughts on that side of things? Uh, yeah, your legacy, what you remember. For, like, yeah, if you look at some of these forums and blogs, then, then you know, I, I remember stopping uh, in my Newport days. I looked at once, I was in a good reign of form. And oh, I look at the, on the, I think it was the Newport blog site. Uh, and then some of the things they were saying were horrendous. I thought, right, not looking, <laughs> not looking at that again. I'm actually playing well at the minute and I'm still getting slated. But, uh, you know, in, in general, you, you obviously get the, the sort of... Uh, a minority of people and have their opinions uh, and you've got to learn to be a bit thick skin but legacy wise i you know i i, I was just a, yeah i was quite a basic player i was but you know i i'd like to think you know it's coming back that i was just a hard working tough player that just you know did the, did the nitty-gritty did the sort of daily work uh and you know i i'm you know, I, I see you know people when they, they come up to me they sort of remember that fondly that it was a you know, it was no frills as such it wasn't any sort of airs and graces. It was, uh, it was wham bam, and you know things need to be done, and and you you were in the thick of the action, and and didn't take a step back, you know, and that's that's you know that that's a nice legacy to sort of be remembered. I think you knowing you didn't take a step back, and and you were respected by opponents that you, uh, you know, I had to overcome you know, lots of coaches being dropped lots of times, getting back in. So I had a bit of bounce back ability, as <laughs> as I said, and. Managed to get back into teams when you know when you know other people were coming through and and you thought you might not get selected again and I managed to stay in there you know I managed to stay in the fight uh, for all those years and realised when I had a few injuries that knocked me back and you know maybe form dipped a bit because of that and realising what my bread and butter was uh, and getting back to that you know it was a physicality. So yeah, being being remembered, you know, just being remembered as a again as, as my life is, you know, where, where my beginnings, it's you know, quite humble as such. And you know, again, without being a, a superstar player, I was I was someone that you know, just stuck in there and 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 gave it as good as I got, you know, for a uh, without uh, you know some of the uh, the ability of some players, you know, if you look at the likes of Alan Wynn, you know, the ability he's got, another, you know, and you look at players throughout the world like the Victor Matfields and the. You know the the players Ali Williams is, you know the ability that some of those guys had were, were incredible. You know, and I, I you know didn't have that, didn't have that speed, power, pace, and I just had to make the best of what I had. So, you know, I was a you know a young kid that was not the biggest, not the strongest, not the fastest, but but managed sixty four caps and twelve years and two grand slams and did did all right. So, uh, you know, people, you know, I get I get some feedback and it's you know it's all it seems to be. It seems to be pretty positive when I get it, which is which is, which is always nice. You're always you're always going to get the one person player that maybe we didn't like you so much, but you know I, I I've taken worse on the chin, so that, that it doesn't bother me. I just you know I'm just very grateful of a of a, a long career and you know successful career. You know with with highs and lows, it wasn't all plain sailing, but uh, yeah, it was it was fun. So so parts of the world that I've never have seen, met people I've never have thought I've met, and it's you know given me. Lots of opportunities give me the chance to do what I do now with with flying and uh, and other other aspects of work as well and and go in front of these kids and trying to help uh, them try and succeed and trying to you know make the best of of, of their ability because sometimes these these youngsters these boys you know don't think they've got anything you know they, they don't think and it's only when you awaken that you awaken that sort of uh, you know turn the lights on awaken it 
that they realize that they can do something and when you see them starting to achieve you get a get a huge buzz from that as well because again we, we've all got it in us it's just uh, it's just how we motivate ourselves and and kick that attitude in place to sort of uh, to take that step forward yeah absolutely i mean it's it, it's a very profound um assessment and um humble but again people can learn from that people can take life lessons from that hard work dedication um and you know it sort of shows people what's possible if you, if you apply yourself and I know it sounds almost like a little bit of a cliche, but it is true, and, and your life um, really, really indicates that. So, last question then, um, just to wrap this up, and you were talking about the fans and, and everything just now, this question is about them. Uh, obviously, for the people who are out there who um, supported your career, um, personally, obviously, supported Wales and supported everything um, as a team, um, basically, those people that were good to you, um, whether it was in person or whether it was on social media, and, um, Social media has obviously developed into, into what it is now during your career as well. But basically, anyone that was positive to the fans out there, the sport would be nothing without them. So, what would you basically what would you say to your fans and to rugby fans um, around the world who might be watching this? I, I like to close out with this question because um, we've talked about a lot of things that young athletes can benefit from. We've talked about things that the players can benefit from, and people in general um, can apply to life. Um, but just looking at it from a different point of view, those people who support. Um, Welsh rugby and, and everything like that. What would you say to your your fans around the world? That is that is depression basically to close out with. Yeah, do you know what the game is nothing without the fans. Uh, uh, and I was a fan. You know, I, I, I was a, as a as a young lad. I was a fan. I remember watching uh, New Zealand play Ponypool in Ponypool Park when I must have been I don't know thirteen something like that. They give us an afternoon off school to watch it. You know, I was a fan. Stood on the bank cheering. You know, I think Garen Jenkins was playing for Ponypool at the time, and I managed to lace my boots up with Wales with them a few, quite a few times as well. Um, you know, it, it, again, it is nothing. I remember Jamie Roberts coming up to me um, and, and say thanking me as he he was coming. You know, he was coming good, Jamie. And he said, "I used to support Newport. I was, you know, I was local to Newport, and uh, it was only you and Rod Snow. I think you said at that time you should stay out and sign our autographs." And he said, "The amount of autographs I had off you and Rod, you know, because you you would stay out and have time for us." Uh, and that sort of sunk in with me, you know, it's, you know, having, you know, we were all fans. We were, you know, even the best players in the world as kids, as grown up, they were fans of the game and they were inspired by their heroes. Uh, and, you know, these professional, these gladiators that used to go out on the, you know, and on the pitch uh, and, and sort of lay battle. Uh, so you know, if, we, if we went out there, if without any fans there, then it would be a pretty, you know, we, we saw a bit of it in COVID, didn't we? Where they, you know, these empty stadiums and it just wasn't the same. I, I felt from the boys in the Lions trip, um, because like the Zamet and gang that, you know, the first Lions trip uh, and it was in empty stadiums and, and you just think, oh, they've been robbed of something here because, you know, the game, as good as game is, without, without those people that support it. And, uh, you know, it's their life as well. It's people's lives. They go out, they travel the world. You know, they, they travel or spend lots of money, you know, you know, their means to get out there and support. And, uh, you know, the game isn't a fraction of, you know, of the game without them. So, uh, yeah, they, they do an amazing job. But again, I'm back to being a fan now. You know, I've uh, been out of the rugby a couple of years now and it's back to, you know, we, we watch the local games and we got one of, the, one of our local friends here. Puts, you know, he's got his nice little big screen and it's nice big screen there and, a couple of beers and, and we go and we play silly games on who scores the first try and uh, uh, what the score will be and other things and, and have some banter around it and get the occasional game as well. So, you know, I'm back into fan mode after after living and breathing it for almost 20 years. You know, I'm back sitting sitting in the stands and, uh, and cheering. I, I get to watch a fair few games and commentate on them now, which makes you concentrate on it uh, even more, which is fun uh, as well. I get a bit of a kick from that. So it's... Uh, you know, there's nothing like a, a full stadium. Um, you know, cheering, jeering, doing whatever, whatever they do, creating that atmosphere. You know, that's what makes it special. Absolutely, yeah, it certainly is. It's you know, it's it's the backbone of, of the whole thing, and that's why I uh, I like to close out with that. But honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure um, talking with you today, and, and we've got into some good stuff, and you know, hopefully, we've got into a nice mix of things as well, um, some of which will. Uh, will definitely be of interest to people. So, last thing for me to do, like I said at the beginning, just say a big thank you for your time, big thank you for coming on, obviously taking time out of uh, your evening, late in, you know, late in the evening, to uh, sort of talk with me and, and sort of share everything that you've shared. Um, it's been absolute pleasure and, and an honour, to be honest. So, 
Thank you very much for that, mate. I, I appreciate it. Ah, oh, no problem at all. I thanks. I've enjoyed. I say enjoy like writing writing the book. You know, it's it's reminiscent. It's going back through career and you know what I say. Enjoyed. You know, some, some, you know, I say enjoy every minute. There were certain parts you didn't enjoy so much, but uh, it's always nice looking back. And, and I, that's why the, the night with Andy and, and Matthew, the night was great because you got to reminisce with uh, with your old colleagues and get you back together and, and just you know, just remind yourselves of how fun this game can be. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, honestly, yeah, it's been it's been incredible. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.